Bolton was one of the most important mill towns in England. Several of the most important inventions of the Industrial Revolution were the brain children of Bolton residents, making them some of the richest people in the country. Bolton is also a famous film location, with Le Mans Crescent featuring many times in movies and TV shows. But there is much more to see here, and this walk features the best places to visit. The large building along the east side of Knowsley Street is divided into two distinct sections. The southern part is the older structure, with an impressive portico. Alongside it, on the northern side, is a new modern section. Both are known today as Bolton Marketplace. Bolton has had a market since 1251. When it opened, market stalls occupied Churchgate, but expanded into many of the smaller streets over the years. In the mid-19th century, the town trustees decided the market had outgrown its capacity and needed a new dedicated building. The area where Bolton Marketplace now stands was once a field where cattle grazed. There was also a timber yard here. The river Kroll, which passed through the fields, has been covered and now flows underground. The first market hall opened in 1855. It was made with a steel frame, which you can still see today, and bricks and slate. There were small towers on each corner, with roofs made of copper. It emphasised the best of Victorian architecture, and its glass roof provided natural light and good ventilation. The hall has been refurbished twice, first in 1894 and then again in 1938, both improving the original design. The market initially had one floor where the stalls were built, two main doors opened to a passage, allowing wagons to drive in along a central aisle. The large space between the stalls also provided room for customers to wander around freely and check the merchandise. The modern northern section of the market was built in 1988 and cost £25 million and was opened by the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh in November 1988. This addition created a contemporary retail and leisure centre for the town. At the same time, the original inside space was split, adding a new floor, and the original vaults were opened as a restaurant space. A large car park was also added. Walking inside, one can't help noticing the original steel frame that still holds the roof alongside contemporary artwork decorating the walls. The statue of Fred Dibner will give you a friendly smile as you walk through Bolton Town Centre in the middle of the entrance to Oxford Street. His black figure stands proudly with a cap on his head and round glasses on his face. Dr Fred Dibner, MBE, Steeplejack is inscribed beneath his image. A steeplejack is a craftsperson who scales buildings to repair chimneys and church steeples. So Fred Dibner certainly had a job worthy of respect and one that most people wouldn't or couldn't do. But what made him want to climb and repair the tall buildings of Bolton? Born in Bolton on the 29th of April 1939, Fred Dibner grew up fascinated by the steam engines and mechanical engineering that kept the town going, particularly the tall chimneys of the textile mills. Fred Dibner became a TV personality when, in 1978, he was filmed by the BBC repairing Bolton Town Hall. This was followed by a documentary about him, his work and his love of steam engines. Fred Dibner, Steeplejack won a BAFTA for Best Documentary and made Fred Dibner a household name. In the 1990s, he also presented a TV programme about the Industrial Revolution and its legacy in Britain. He therefore taught millions of people in the UK not only about the work of the steeplejack, but also about the rich industrial heritage of steam engineering. Fred Dibner died in Bolton on the 9th of November 2004, aged 66. His coffin was pulled by his son, driving a restored tractor with a steam engine. Thousands of people donated a total of £45,000 to pay for the Fred Dibner statue to be created. Jane Robbins of Nutsford created the eight-foot statue and it was unveiled on the 29th of April 2008.
The statue stands in front of the Corliss engine, created by Nick Hargreaves & Co in 1866, who used it until 1966 and donated it in 1973. George Henry Corliss of Rhode Island invented the Corliss steam engine. The main advantage of the new engine over older engines was the use of a valve gear. The gear regulated the flow of steam based on the speed of the cylinder movement. This feature improved the engine's efficiency by more than 30%, making it for the first time more economical than a water mill. Many local bank branches in town centres hide an interesting history that sometimes hold very close ties to the prosperity and economic development of that town. The three storeys building with a segmental cornice boasting a coat of arms in Deansgate, now a branch of NatWest, is such a place. Until the beginning of the 19th century, the Bank of England was the only partnership-controlled company providing banking services and issuing banknotes. As with other parts of the country, the Industrial Revolution created a new class of wealthy people in Bolton. They decided to join and create partnership-controlled companies that provided banking services and could issue notes outside of London. Other banks in Northampton, Bristol, Manchester and Liverpool District were also established. All these banks had an agent in London with an account at the Bank of England. In 1818, five partners joined and formed the New Bank for Savings in Bolton. Their initial security is not clear, but their business grew fast, and within three years, they had deposits of £44,250, which is over £50 million in today's money. Profits also increased steadily, from several hundred pounds in 1821 to several thousand a few years later. In the 19th century, working-class people didn't have a bank account. Their earnings of about 20 to 25 shillings a month, about £1,000 of today's money, were used on that week's expenditures. If any funds were left, they were kept in a jar at home. Accommodation and food were the main expenses. Highly skilled workers and business owners did manage to save some money. Building societies which started to be established in the late 18th century provided that service. So only a few fortunate families in Bolton could use the services of the newly established bank. Some of the people who did so were Samuel Taylor Chadwick, a doctor and philanthropist whose statue stands in Victoria Square, and B.A. Dobson, the town's mayor. Despite growing profits, the bank didn't have a smooth sale in its first years. In 1825, the bank suffered a sophisticated theft. The thieves opened the safe with false keys and escaped with several thousands of pounds worth of gold and bank-issued notes. The 1830s were challenging to private banks in England, with several runs on the bank recorded. The Bank of Bolton survived and later strengthened its situation by becoming a limited liability company, no longer relying on the wealth of the partners for survival. Several branches were opened in neighbouring towns. In 1878, the Bank of Bolton was bought by the Bank of Manchester and Salford. It continued operating under its own name for another 18 years, when it became part of Manchester and County Bank Limited in 1896. The National Westminster Bank, whose branch you see here today, acquired this bank in the 1960s. Arkwright's Barbershop may now look like a regular shop at 17 Churchgate, but the white sign on the wall tells us that this was once owned and run by Richard Arkwright. Arkwright's Barbershop was the site of Richard Arkwright's wig-making business in the 1760s. This occupation led Arkwright to fame for his invention of the water frame spinning machine. The plaque above the shop tells us he was a barber and a peruke maker. A peruke was the name for the powdered wigs we often see images of from the 18th century, commonly worn by men, especially the wealthy. It doesn't tell us that Arkwright was born to humble beginnings in Preston as one of 13 children in 1732 of whom only seven survived. His family was too poor to send him to school, so his cousin taught him to read and write. At a young age, he was sent to be an apprentice with Mr Nicholson, the owner of his shop. 
Arkwright's experience with wig making and his curious and resourceful nature led him to invent a waterproof dye. His earnings allowed him to move on to more extraordinary inventions, the first of which was the water frame spinning machine, facilitating the productions of wigs. Richard Arkwright patented his invention in 1769 after returning to Preston. The design, created with a clockmaker John Kay, was certainly worked on at Arkwright's address in Stonygate, Preston, later named Arkwright House. The spinning frame was significant, as it created twisted threads, not by hand, as they had been up until then, but with metal and wooden cylinders within a frame. This made the cost of spinning cotton cheaper, and changed the course of the textile industry, which was, of course, very significant in the history of Northern England. Richard Arkwright opened Cromford Mill in Nottingham, where Arkwright and partners created the first water-powered mill in the world. He later built a second mill at Cromford and obtained a great patent in the 1770s. Having expanded Cromford Mill as much as possible, he created more mills and factories around the country. Arkwright was married twice, his first wife died only a year after their marriage, when he was 24. He only had two surviving children from his two wives. Richard Arkwright died as one of the wealthiest men in Britain in 1792, aged 59. His wealth was distributed between his children, leaving the mills to his son, Richard Arkwright Jr. After his father's death, Arkwright Jr. sold some of his father's mills, investing his money wisely becoming even wealthier than his father. At some point, he was regarded as the richest, non-aristocrat person in Britain. On his death, his estate was estimated to be worth £3 million, almost £4 billion in today's money. As well as this plaque in Bolton, which marks where Richard Arkwright's barbershop once stood, there is a blue plaque to Arkwright, where he once lived in Adam Street in London. Two trusts were formed, the Arkwright Society, which owns his mills to restore them, and the Arkwright Scholarships Trust, which has awarded over 5,000 scholarships in technology and engineering. Therefore, as Arkwright revolutionised the cotton industry and Northern England itself, his legacy continues. Walking along Churchgate, it is very easy to see this beautiful old timber-framed building. This is the Ye Old Man and Scythe Public House, Bolton's oldest public house and one of the ten oldest pubs in Britain. The phrase Ye Old, which means the old, is officially reserved for the truly old pubs or other establishments to distinguish them from just old places. It is not known when Ye Old Man and Scythe was built, but the first mention of its name, originally called the Man and Scythe, dates back to 1251. The current building was rebuilt in 1636 and remodelled as recently as the 20th century. Still, some of its beams date to 1636 and the cellar is original to that date. However, the pub's historical importance is exhibited inside by a chair with an inscription. It reads, 15th of October 1651. In this chair, James, 7th Earl of Derby, sat at the Man and Scythe Inn, Churchgate, Bolton, immediately before his execution. Indeed, James Stanley, 7th Earl of Derby, was executed by beheading outside ye old Man and Scythe in 1651. However, he earned this sentence by corresponding with Charles II, which was considered treason by Parliament during the English Civil War. He was sent here to be executed for his involvement in the storming of Bolton. This event, also known as the Bolton Massacre, occurred in 1644. At the time, royalists captured Bolton and about 1,600 inhabitants of Bolton were killed. Stanley was married to Charlotte de la Tremoil, who was descended from the Dutch royal family. At the time of his execution, he had seven children four sons and three daughters. His eldest son became the 8th Earl of Derby and continued the dynasty. He also had three other children who died young. While this event is rooted well in the past, the story does not end there. James Stanley 
is still much with us today in the form of a ghost. Many people have reported seeing him and apparently he causes much mischief around the pub during these appearances. Some CCTV clips are said to have captured his actions. For those who do not believe in the stories of Stanley's ghost, there is also said to be the ghost of a little girl called Jenny. Walking into a churchyard breaks the hustle and bustle of the town, providing some tranquility to visitors and time to reflect. The large St Peter's Church, with its prominent position above the River Crowell, does precisely that. While it looks old, the church was completed in 1871 and resembles a 14th century religious building, built in a Gothic revival style. This style can be identified, among other elements, by the lancet windows, the long and narrow windows at the top of the nave, and the long conic spires surrounding the roof and the tower. It was built on a previous church location that stood on this site since the 15th century. The old church was a low structure, providing for the parish of Bolton Le Mors, that covered a large area of Bolton from the 14th century until the 1840s. When that old church was demolished, as it had fallen into disrepair, stones from an earlier church were discovered, suggesting there had been one there since Norman times. St Peter's Church is currently in the deanery and archdeaconry of Bolton, the Diocese of Manchester and the province of York. The church is the Civic Church of Bolton and is known in the town as the Parish Church. The east of the parish church is dedicated to the memory of Peter Ormond, who was a cotton manufacturer and banker whose father founded the Bank of Bolton. Here are some technical details about this structure. The building of St Peter's Church, consecrated in June 1871, the tower boasts a height of 55 metres, 180 feet, and at the time of construction was the tallest in Lancashire. It houses a peal of 13 bells and impressive glass windows. Five of the bells were cast in 1699 but had to be replaced in 1974, but the tenor bell, also cast in 1699, remains in use. The tenor bell is inscribed, I to the church the living call, and to the grave do summon all Henry Bagley made me, 1699. Other features include a painted chancel roof and a stained glass window that dates to the previous building from 1699. If you like organ music, you will be pleased to know that this church's organ dates to 1882. It was built by A.G. Hill, with some pipes used from the previous organ from 1795. It was rebuilt in 2008 by York's principal pipe organs and has 3,000 internal pipes, the longest of which is 16 feet long and the smallest is half an inch. Walk around the churchyard and next to the entrance where you'll be able to find the graves of some of the more prominent people of the town, Samuel Crompton and Samuel Chadwick. Their statues are in the town centre. Crompton had also got married in here. However, happy events are also celebrated in this church. Another special marriage ceremony featured on the BBC programme Songs of Praise when a young couple exchanged their vows at the height of the Covid pandemic in late 2020. While observing Covid regulations and restrictions, the church priest and his team ensured that the young couple could cherish this event for the rest of their lives. The only mark that gives this building's prominence away is the sign on the wall, briefly telling us of its history. The building beside the parish church is not that old, but the Bolton Grammar School it had been briefly home to has a much longer history. However, with this small building lies a great history. In 1819, the Factory Act hoped to change the lives of working-class children. Up until that point, children would commonly work in the factories. It was also unlikely that they would have received a normal education. The Act forbade the employment of children under the age of nine, and from 1833, children had to attend at least two hours of formal education per day. Unfortunately, this was not enforced, although some mills had established schools for those children over nine. 
After a long day's work, it was hard for the children to stay awake, let alone learn anything. Luckily, learning to read and write was still done via church Sunday school. In 1870, the Bolton School Board made it compulsory for children between 5 and 13 to attend school, and families risked fines if they failed to do so. Wealthy families had different choices. Their children attended fee-paying schools, the oldest of which here was Bolton Grammar School, which had used this building for its boy classrooms for a brief period. It was first recorded in 1516, and thus is the oldest school in Bolton. The school moved from here in 1899 to the current premises in Chorley, New Road. When the school left, the building became the Church Institute, and today is the Church Hall. Today, the area you are exploring now is an industrial estate. The only period house is the one you are standing next to, Anchor House. The high relief on the wall with the image of an anchor is the only reminder of its past. However, a few decades ago, there had been an important establishment here. This is the site of Eagle Street College. Eagle Street College was not an actual college or even a building, but was a literary society, established informally in 1885 at James William Wallace's house in Eagle Street. This was a society that specifically read and discussed the works of the American poet Walt Whitman. Eagle Street College was renamed Bolton Whitman Fellowship later in Whitman's honour. The members called themselves Whitmanites. They also wrote letters to Walt Whitman and celebrated Whitman Day yearly on Walt Whitman's birthday on the 31st of May. Eagle Street College is also a key part of the town's LGBTQ plus history. Walt Whitman, the poet, journalist and essayist, who was born in the USA in 1819 and died in 1892, is known to have been gay or bisexual. His work contains themes of homosexuality. These themes were possibly discussed by the founding members of Eagle Street College, James William Wallace, Dr John Johnston and Fred Wilde. In Stephen M. Hornby's play, The Adhesion of Love, the men were portrayed as homosexual. The play is about the life of James William Wallace and his visit to Walt Whitman's home in New Jersey a year before his death in 1891. The Adhesion of Love was performed in Bolton Museum and Bolton Socialist Club and other venues in the north of England. Eagle Street College continued after the death of Walt Whitman in 1892 and after the death of the group's founder, James William Wallace, in 1926. Their celebrations of Whitman Day continued until the 1930s. A plaque marks some of these celebrations in Rivington Unitarian Chapel in Rivington, Lancashire. In Rivington Lane, the plaque with an image of lilac reads, I give you my sprig of lilac, WW. In these grounds and the chapel house beyond, the followers of Walt Whitman, known as Eagle Street College, celebrated the poet's life and works. Many of the group's items are now in Bolton Library, including a stuffed canary that Walt Whitman gifted to Eagle Street College. Bolton has several rivers flowing through and around it. The River Tong, which passes under the main road, is one of them. The name comes from Old English and means a fork in the river. It emerges as an amalgamation of the Ashley Brook and Eagley Brook at Smith Hills. It flows into the Kroll River a few miles downstream and ultimately into the River Mersey. Look over the bridge on the north side where its barrier is much higher than the south one. You'll see that the river bank is very steep, making the river's ravine very deep on that side. It is part of only a few sites of special scientific interest, SSSI, in the Manchester area. The river supports several species of fish and anglers use it for recreational purposes. However, recently, the invasive walking catfish originating from Asia was found to have made the river their home here. The fish is large for these waters and can wriggle across dry land, searching for other water sources, hence its name. Its sting produces a toxic substance which, while it is not pleasant when pricks the skin, is not dangerous to humans.
The period gatehouses that stand on each side of the cemetery entrance are appropriate for Tong Cemetery. A public cemetery still in use today, it is located on the bank of the River Tong. The cemetery was once part of the township of Tong with Hall, but today it is part of Bolton. Opened on New Year's Eve in 1856, Tong Cemetery is Bolton's oldest cemetery and was designed by William Henderson, Charles Holt and John Smallman Smith. There are over 116,000 burials at this cemetery. Over 415,000 of Bolton's burial records are available online, including records of the burials at Tong Cemetery, on the website Deceased Online. Walk around the grounds and several notable people are buried here. The first burial at Tong Cemetery in 1856 was that of Thomas Allen of Little Bolton, who was 70 years old. Robert Lever Bailey died on the 31st of March 1865, aged 47. He was buried in April of that year. His gravestone shows he was a part of the Order of Druids Bolton District, around an image of his face at the top. The Society Brethren paid for the headstone as he was secretary for eight years. John Fawcett of Bolton died in October 1867, aged 77. He was both a shoemaker and musician, having taught himself to be an organist, choir leader and composer. The well-known one-armed Irish lion tamer Thomas Mackart died quite gruesomely in 1872, aged 34. He was performing at Maserati in Manda's Menagerie Circus when the performance went terribly wrong in January 1872 and the lions attacked him. He died from his wounds to the horror of the audience. The owner of Manda's Menagerie, Rosina Manders, paid for a marble and granite monument to Thomas McCart, which reads, In memory of the great lion tamer Thomas McCart, aged 34, killed at Bolton, January 3rd, 1872, by the lions in Manda's Star Menagerie, erected to the memory of an old and faithful servant by Mrs. Rosina Manders, sole proprietress of the Grand National Star Menagerie. When thou hearest of a fellow mortal being suddenly plunged into eternity, think of the mercy that has spared thee. The lion who killed McCart became known as the McCart Lion and died of natural causes in 1874. The McCart Lion was mounted by taxidermist Roland Ward and displayed in Piccadilly, London. Another notable person of Bolton who is buried here is Fred Dibner. The corner of this tranquil street holds a surprise in the form of an old house, which later became the house of Fred Dibner. The house itself was built in 1854 as a park keeper's lodge for the first public park in Bolton. The park was established by the Earl of Bradford and was part of his estate, hence the red coat of arms you see over the window on the left gable. Fred Dibner bought the house in the 1960s and lived there until he died in 2004. He converted some of the back outbuildings to become a steam engine workshop. After his death, the house had struggled to be sold and only in 2009 it found a new owner. The house is owned by a private family who turned it into a heritage centre in Dibner's memory. The house's structure is quite surprising as from the street it looks like a single storey house. Only the tall chimney suggests that it may be different. Indeed, from the back of the house, it has two storeys and is much larger than anticipated. Dr Fred Dibner, MBE Steeplejack, as he is named on his statue in the town centre, was both a well-known steeplejack and media personality. He was a craftsperson who, as a steeplejack, would climb tall buildings to make repairs to church steeples and chimneys. In 1978, he repaired Bolton Town Hall. He was filmed for a BBC documentary, Fred Dibner Steeplejack, which won a BAFTA for Best Documentary. After this, he continued to be a media personality, presenting TV in the 1990s, including a documentary about the Industrial Revolution. Fred Dibner was born in Bolton in 1939 and passed away in Bolton in 2004, aged 66. This charming house with large garden around it, tucked away just next to the main road, is Hoff Hall. 
It was originally built as a manor house for the Hoff family in 1597. As the timber frame structure suggests, however, it may incorporate an earlier chapel. In 1639, the hall was sold to Sir Orlando Bridgman. He belonged to a very prominent family, including the future Earl of Bradford. Excavations made in the 19th century showed that the hall had a small domestic chapel next to which a grave was unearthed, containing an urn along with human bones, a bronze spearhead and armour. The family owned the house until the 20th century, until the Bolton Council bought it, just before it was due for demolition. They sympathetically restored it, and today it is a private five-bedroom house. Hoff is a small township in Bolton, and the name means a small fork in the river, referring to the land between the Kroll and Tong Brook. Sir Orlando Bridgman was a very prominent member of the English judicial system, serving as a sergeant at law and chief baron of the Exchequer. The last role is an interesting one. The word baron in this context means a judge. The chief baron was the top ranking judge presiding in cases concerning monetary issues. It was also the head of the Exchequer, Court of Pleas, separated from the King's Bench, which was the main court of the Crown after the English Civil War. He received the Baronet of Great Lever in 1660. Sir Orlando was a devoted royalist during the reigns of King Charles I and Charles II. He was one of the judges trying the regicides, those accused of killing a monarch, of King Charles I in 1660. Sir Orlando was married twice and had five children. Of his three sons, one inherited his title, while the other two received a baronet of their own. His two daughters married husbands, one with a baronet title and the other a man who was only a knighted. During Victorian times, many public bathhouses were opened to provide a necessary service for working families. When many people moved into towns to work at the newly opened factories, families had very little room in their accommodation for baths and cleanliness activities. A worker's family's accommodation had consisted of a single bedroom, a small kitchen with a dining table and very little else. Sanitary needs were met by using a tub into which boiling water was poured, along with jugs of cold water brought from the public tap. Each member of the family used in turn. The head of the family would go first, the children next, and the lady of the house used it last, also using the water to do the laundry. Public baths provided the family with an opportunity to wash and do laundry for a minimal fee. The going rate for such services was one penny for a cold bath, two pennies for a warm one and four pennies would allow the wife and children to wash and do the family's laundry. The former public baths on Lower Bridgman Street were Bolton's oldest public bath. Today it is a lone, two storeys building with a set of six Tuscan colonnade. It contained a large pool for working men and a smaller one for the ladies. It became one of the country's first public pools. But that was not enough. As a public facility for the working people, it also was furnished with a dance hall called Ulna Hall. The wash facilities were opened in 1845 at the cost of £4,500. The public pool for working men was opened in 1846 and was announced in the newspapers. At the beginning of the 20th century, sanitary facilities at homes had improved dramatically. Most houses had plumbing and it was easier to follow a better hygienic regime. The use of the washhouses dwindled and the council took the building over in 1917. The assembly rooms, as inscribed over the main entrance, were added at the time. Towards the 1970s, the building became unused. The council planned to demolish the building in 1977 due to its derelict and dangerous condition. Still, the building survived and is now Bolton Business Centre. As you walk further along Glebe Street, don't forget to look to your right to see a large mural. This is a striking work of art and is a very unexpected scene. The large mural on the side of a former mill building in Savile Street, Bolton, beautifully tells the history of this town through graffiti art. It is 50 feet by 40 feet and was created by two graffiti artists, Tony Brady 
also known as Kelzo, Kelzo, and Evan Barlow, also known as Entice. They were commissioned by the building owners, the Mandale Group, at the beginning of 2020, so of course they were then limited by the COVID-19 outbreak. Still, the mural was successfully completed within three months, being finished and fully revealed in July 2020. The mural depicts the history of the former mill building it is painted on the side of, as well as the industrial history of Bolton as a town. We can see in the mural the factories and their chimneys. It also features Samuel Crompton and his spinning mule and the owner of the mill, Joshua Barber. You will also see a woman representing the women workers in the cotton industry, with more workers behind. The diversity of Bolton is also represented by a mosque and a building from Bucharest, which represents Bolton's Romanian workers. Look into the mural yourself and see what more you can gain from it and what more of Bolton's history you can learn from this. Tom Brady, the graffiti artist Kelzo, said, This is a gift to the people of Bolton. I've left something for people to enjoy, which inspires them to get excited about the town. Murals encourage people to interact with the town's history, and this mural absolutely does do that, as a beautiful tribute to Bolton's industrial history. Bolton's industrial past can be seen in every corner, and this tall, freestanding chimney is no different. This red brick chimney, close to the junction of Salop Street and Bridgman Place, is also known as Threlfall's Chimney, with Threlfall written on one side of the chimney as it was a part of the Richard Threlfall Group's mill, Threlfall's Mill. This family business was started here in 1834 by Richard Threlfall and is therefore one of the oldest family businesses in Bolton, as it still survives over 185 years later. It started by manufacturing textile machinery for the cotton industry. The business has diversified over the years, and there are now three lines of contemporary product manufacturing. Automation is now a significant asset of the firm, allowing it to reduce the workforce, from 200 in the 1950s to 30 today. The family business moved to Lostock in 2000. One key product manufactured by the company is engine valves, some of a very high spec, used in the Royal Navy submarines. During World War II, the factory here was converted to manufacture shells for the 25 pound and 17 pound guns and rockets. There were 250 women employed to help with manufacturing in the war in place of the men who served in battle. In 2010, David Threlfall Hurst, at the age of 58, and a descendant from Richard Threlfall, scaled the 150-foot chimney to raise the profile of a children's charity. Sadly, he passed away in 2019, aged 73. Bolton has a long history of education, with two grammar school buildings still standing. One is located near the parish church, and the other is here. It's a large, three storeys, red terracotta building, featuring a small cupola in the middle of the roof. Notice the special entrance for boys on the left and for girls on the right. The former county grammar school on Great Moor Street was only established as Bolton County Grammar School in 1947. Previous to this name change, the school was first opened in 1881 as Bolton Higher Grade School elsewhere in town. It had started with 50 pupils who had been receiving scholarships. The school gained a good reputation and in 1885 there were 380 pupils and the fee was established at nine pennies a week. Education was not compulsory then, but that changed in 1889 when the new law was passed making it compulsory for parents to send their children to school until the age of 13. The school could accommodate up to 550 pupils and girls were able to attend to study domestic sciences. In 1897, Bolton Higher Grade School and another bigger school in the area, Cannon Slade School, combined and moved to Great Moor Street. This newer building cost £3,000 and could hold up to 1,080 pupils over four floors. World War II had made the school unsafe for children as it was situated next to railway lines 
making it a target for German bombing. The school had to split the children among four other schools. In 1941, when the RAF won the Battle of Britain and the danger of bombing subsided, the school reunited. In 1966, the school was moved to Bremet and it became Withens School in 1982, a comprehensive school. Looking back at their memories from the school, pupils have commented on their experience to be very happy. They have fond memories of favourite teachers. The school's extracurriculum activities was a great attraction, with sport being their most favourable. Other pupils with more academic aspirations have commented on the facilities the schools provided, such as the chemistry laboratory. As you walk down Maudsley Street, you can't avoid noticing several buildings which display a similar style. Maudsley Street is one of Bolton's best preserved historic streets, with buildings from the 19th century. However, the first one on your left at the corner, with Bold Street, is the one that interests us. The inscription over the main entrance says, Bolton Technical School, also known as Bolton Community College. During the 19th century, Britain had excelled in its industrial technology. Still, it needed to stay ahead of its American and continental competitors. A report by the Royal Commission stated that educating the workers was a way to achieve this. So like in many places in Britain, Bolton got to have its own technical school. The first building used as a school was donated by the Mechanics Institute, having been their building since 1868. Additional funds were raised with the help of the trades organisation and working men of Bolton, totalling the £5,000 needed to convert the building into a school and an additional £600 a year as running costs. The school was opened in 1891 and attracted many pupils. Studies were focused on the technical aspects of milling and other technical elements of contemporary industry and general studies. Students over 14 were accepted who had an academic aptitude, but older people were initially admitted too. The demand for places grew rapidly to the point that additional premises were needed. One was acquired in Bridgman Place and opened in 1895. This was called the Bridgman Place Technical School of Engineering and Technical Subjects. The school had over 300 science students, nearly 200 students of technology and 50 art students. Further premises were acquired during the beginning of the 20th century. In total, there were nine schools in Bolton providing technical education. In 1950, the Technical Institute became an official college, which in 1963 amalgamated with Bolton University. Apprenticeships were the primary method of training young people into industry. This formed the entire programme, an educational part of the technical school. Until the school opened, it was up to the employer to train their apprentices under their own terms. These young people's wages were very low, starting at five shillings a week at the age of 14, about £150 in today's money, thus making it worthwhile for the firms to employ apprentices. As a result, the level of training became very varied and accidents involving apprentices who were not trained properly were rife. When the school was formed, it offered classes in various technical subjects. However, with the apprentices working 54-hour weeks and starting every day at 6am, it was hard for them to commit to evening classes. The technical school offered apprentices a course on various subjects, lasting two hours every week. Students were accepted at the recommendation of their previous school's headmaster. There were no fees required to attend these classes. Other classes were offered in subsequent years. Some lasted a full day or half a day a week and cost six guineas for a full term. Examinations and certificates were provided at the end of the courses. As the reputation of the apprenticeships grew, so did the number and scope of the courses. From the beginning of the 20th century, Students could enrol on a six year course, six hours a week, with accreditation at the end. Further accreditation was given by the Board of Education and the Union of Lancashire and Cheshire Institutes. Records show that the number of students entering examinations at the beginning of the 20th century was about 2,000 a year, so a high accolade for this programme. Bolton has two cenotaphs. Here, 
is a memorial commemorating 302 soldiers who served in the Bolton Artillery and who gave their lives during World War I and II. The Cenotaph has the names of the 151 soldiers who lost their lives in World War I and 151 names of those who lost their lives in World War II. It was first unveiled on 29th of July 1920 by HRH, the Duke of York. Nelson Square Cenotaph stands in the centre of Nelson Square Gardens. The square predates the cenotaph by about 90 years, having been laid out in 1823 and can be seen on a map of Bolton from 1824. Erecting the statue commemorating Samuel Crompton, which was unveiled in 1857, did stop the townsfolk from using the square as a pig market until the 1890s when the council reclaimed the space and converted it as a public garden. Ormrod, Poweroy and Foy designed the cenotaph. The Portland stone stale has bronze inscription panels and a sloping base. The cenotaph has a wreath carved into the top centre on the front and back and the badge of the Royal Artillery at the top centre with a rose. It is a white ashlar pylon with a carved inscription and bronze panels. The inscription on the cenotaph reads, To the glorious memory of the officers, NCOs and men of the Bolton Artillery who fell during the Great War, 1914 to 1918, and the World War, 1939 to 1945. Our glorious dead, lest we forget, and any other Bolton Artillery men who fell in the 1939 to 45 war. The statue you stand in front of is probably the most celebrated in Bolton. When it was unveiled in 1862, a crowd of thousands witnessed it, and for a good reason. Samuel Crompton was born in Bolton, and he also died here. But his contribution to the prosperity of the town and region goes well beyond that fact. Samuel Crompton was the pioneering inventor of the spinning mule. This invention greatly influenced Bolton industry. It allowed for the establishment of extensive mills, providing employment and income to thousands of families. From an early age, he was introduced to the cotton industry. Samuel was born in 1753 to George Crompton, a caretaker, at Hall, Ilverwood, and Elizabeth Betty Crompton, knee Holt of Turton. Tragically, his father died when Samuel was just five years old, so he had to support his mother to provide for the family by spinning yarn. He did so by using a spinning jenny, which was traditional apparatus for spinning cotton. The jenny, another name for a female donkey, was a piece of very rudimentary machinery that allowed an individual yarn to be manufactured, and it was operated by hand. It could not support the required volume of spinning and was unable to produce an even yarn. As he grew up helping spinning yarn, Crompton saw the deficiencies in it. He devised a plan to create an improved mechanism, but he needed the funds to do so. To achieve this, he played the violin in Bolton Theatre to earn the necessary money for his project. In 1779, he had finally created it the Mule Jenny, later known as the Spinning Mule. The level of accuracy in producing yarn allowed it to be used in muslin production, a finer form of cotton cloth. The mechanism was also called the Hall Either Wood Wheel, named after the house he lived in then with his family. He spent all his funds on the production and improvement of the spinning mule, so much so that he couldn't afford to patent it. Consequently, he only earned £60 for his invention, and so he had to make its use public. His invention's contribution to the country's economy cannot be overestimated. Spinning mules were used extensively all over England, earning the government £350,000 in duties per year. There were over 700,000 people dependent on the spinning mules for their livelihood in 1811. Based on these facts, Crompton presented a case in front of the government, asking them for compensation. In 1812, he finally received a grant of £5,000, about £4.7 million in today's money. 
from Parliament, arranged by the Prime Minister of the time, Robert Peel. On 16th of February 1780, Samuel married Mary Pimlot at Bolton Parish Church. They had eight children. One of them, George Crompton, would continue the family business. Samuel Crompton was unlucky in business and was in debt when he died on 26th of June 1827 in his house in King Street. He was buried at St Peter's Church. The statue in Nelson Square was unveiled more than 30 years after his death when his biography was published, highlighting his contribution to the cotton industry. It was the first civic statue in Bolton. Crompton's black bronze figure sitting on a chair overlooking the street atop a polished granite plinth. Low relief bronze panels depicting Crompton's home Hall Ill the Wood and the spinning mule. As you enter Wood Street, you are immediately transported into the 18th century. This small cul-de-sac features some of the finest Georgian houses in Bolton. Looking at the row of houses on your left-hand side as you enter the street, the houses are now painted in a bright colour. All the houses with three storeys and typical rounded windows on the ground floor were added during Victorian times. This row of houses was built in 1786. On your right is a building originally built as a bank in 1849, but now serves as a restaurant. Further on your right is a row of buildings, numbered 14 to 20, built in 1790 with red bricks. The one that interests us most is number 16, the birthplace of William Hesketh Lever, Lord Leverholm. On the 19th of September 1851, William Lever was born in this house at 16 Wood Street. William Lever, or to use his later full title, William Hesketh Lever. First Viscount Leverholm, also known as Lord Leverholm, would become known as an industrialist, politician and public benefactor. He was the first boy born to his parents after six girls and as a young child had a very sheltered life. He was sent to school across the street with other children of his status. He later studied in the Church Institute until he was 16. Still, his sisters told of his shrewdness and promptness of actions from an early age. Though he started working for his father's grocery business, he founded Lever Brothers in 1885, a soap and cleaning products firm. This became the largest company in Britain and the first modern multinational company. In fact, when Lever Brothers merged with Margarine Uni, they became a company whose name will be very familiar to us all today, Unilever. As Mayor of Bolton from 1918 to 1919, Lord Leverholm worked on a revival of Bolton. His personal contributions to the town include restoring Hall Illa Wood and turning it into a museum. He donated land to create the Lever Park and the Leverholm Park and formed Bolton School. He later became a Liberal MP. Shortly afterwards, he was made a Lord and sitting in the House of Lords. As an industrialist, he was seen as benevolent to his workers, not risking their welfare for his own wealth. However, as his company grew internationally, the firm's treatment of African workers became controversial, as the production of palm oil used in the manufacturing of soap was labour dangerous. Lord Leverholm died on the 7th of May 1925, age 77, at his home in Hampstead. 30,000 people attended his funeral. Bolton Cenotaph holds a major significance for the town. Bolton lost over 3,500 lives in the World War I. There needed to be a commemorative of these lives. It took until 1928, only because of the debate over where the war memorial should stand. The Roll of Honour is not included on the Bolton Cenotaph, however. Opposite in the Town Hall, the Hall of Memories holds the Roll of Honour. There are 3,700 names in the Book of Remembrance there. Just one of the many names included in that of Alice Thomason, which is significant because female names are rare on war memorials of the World War I. Alice Thomason was a nurse with the Queen's Mary Army Auxiliary Corps and died on 30th of May 1918. She is buried in Abbeville Communal Cemetery in France. Bolton involvement and participation in World War I 
developed over time. Bolton's working people became aware of the rising tensions in Europe in 1913 by reading about it in the newspapers. Heated debates broke in the streets and the mills, and emotions ran high. Not that the people were enthusiastic about it, it was just that the monotonous working life provided very little thrills. The views of the Labour Party, which dominant the northwest industrial towns, suppressed any militaristic views. So much so that even men serving in the Territorial Army were fairly relaxed about any future involvement. Just before the declaration of war by Britain, demonstrations in favour of neutrality were held. However, it was recognised that peace at any price was not possible, and Britain's pride and interests could not be jeopardised. After the 4th of August 1914, when Britain joined World War I, military presence became more and more evident. Mobilisation of reserves, regulars and the Territorial Army meant that Bolton's people went to war. The Cenotaph was built in 1928, designed by the architect Arthur J. Hope of Bradshaw Gas and Hope, and funded by the County Borough of Bolton. Located in Victoria Square, opposite the main entrance to the Town Hall, inside a landscaped flower beds and bushes. The main arch is made out of granite, with a bronze cross in the middle. In 1932, Bronze sculptures were also added, sculpted by Walter Marsden, a Lancashire-born architect. The statue on the north side is named Struggle, showing a seated female figure representing peace, restraining a man trying to free himself. And the other is named Sacrifice, depicting the same female figure with a dead figure of a man on her lap. The presence of men and women in the war memorial is alluded to in the inscription on the front that reads, In undying memory of the men and women of Bolton who gave their lives in the Great War, 1914 to 1919. However, 1939 to 1945 has also been added alongside 1914 to 1919 next to the inscription to remember those who died in the World War II. An inscription above the Bolton Cenotaph reads, Tell ye your children, our brothers died, too in a better. Word our part must be to strive, for truth, goodwill and peace, that their self-sacrifice be not in vain, lest we forget. This inscription alludes to a quote from the Bible. Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. Joel 1, 3. This grand building dominating Victoria Square is a fitting home for the Borough Council of Bolton. The borough was created only in 1838. Before, the area had comprised of a group of small towns and districts. Each such town had its own town hall. The management of these districts and towns was firmly in the hands of a few wealthy people and they didn't divulge powers to the working classes. However, as the Industrial Revolution progressed, more people became prosperous and called for local government reform. This came with the incorporation of Bolton Borough. The new Borough Council needed a new home, but it took almost 40 years to build one. An initial budget of £40,000, over £45 million in today's money, was allocated. The designer, George Woodhouse, was selected by a competition. Woodhouse designed the building in a mixture of styles. The building is a neoclassical style with a Baroque Revival style tower in a classical temple form. Note the large portico porch, characterised by the large columns, towers and asymmetrical layout. Within the decorative pediment is a bright, white, high relief portraying symbolic figures. Along the front of the building is a series of composite columns combining two or more of the classical column forms Toscana, Doric, Ionic and Corinthian. The very tall tower in contrast is much more decorative, especially nearer the top, ornate with statues. What is also unique about this building today is the peregrine falcons that have nested in the tower since 2008. Bolton Town Hall boasts a council chamber, hall of memories and banqueting hall. 
as well as this, there are sculptures by W. Calder Marshall, R.A., which represent Bolton, manufacture and commerce. The town hall had to be reconstructed in 1981 after damage from a fire. The town hall is currently closed to visitors due to the Covid pandemic. In 2017, a tribute was made in the town hall to the women in Bolton's history with the Brilliant Bolton Women. A total of 11 significant Boltonian women were highlighted with photographs along a corridor of Bolton Town Hall. This included historical women such as the suffragette Elizabeth Ann Anderson, the Egyptologist and philanthropist Annie Barlow, who contributed to the Egyptian exhibitions in Bolton Museum, activist and suffragist Sarah Reddish, and Bolton's first female mayor, Helen Wright. More modern women included are the first Muslim woman elected to Bolton Council, Councillor Safrana Bashir Ishmael, in 2006. Bolton Council's first female chief executive, Margaret Asquith, in 2016, and many others.